Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rick Noguchi. I'm the Vice President of External Relations here at the Japanese American National Museum. Let me introduce our first speaker, or someone who will introduce Holly. It's a special guest. Uh, he is a trustee of the museum. Uh, you might know him as Sulu, but uh, George Takei is here, and uh, he's going to come up and introduce Holly. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and join you all. Uh, please forgive my appearance. I'm in the middle of uh, a film that we're working on titled American. It's about a veteran of the 442nd who is a volunteer docent at the Japanese American National Museum. <laughs> and yesterday we filmed here and at the uh, Gopher Broke Monument. And tomorrow, we'll be back filming here at the museum and the monument. Of all days today, when we have this Los Angeles premiere of uh, Never Surrender, we're filming in North Hollywood. <laughs> because our director found what he called the perfect Echo Park Japanese American home in North Hollywood. <laughs> And so uh, we're in the middle of a shoot, but I've been able to uh, cajole him into giving me a couple of hours so that I could come down to uh, join you uh, briefly for this opening. It's, um, uh, I'm playing a 93-year-old man, <laughs> much older than me. <laughs> but the magic of uh, Hollywood and the makeup people, uh, what you see is what I'm going to look like in 13 more years. <laughs> but I like to think it's my power as an actor that's going to convince you that I am indeed a 93-year-old docent and a veteran of uh, the 442nd. It's an important picture uh, uh, that uh, also, I think, uh, is going to contribute to a good, solid discussion about our environment today. Uh, it's called American, and I hope you'll uh, uh, support the film when it comes out uh, probably in another year, year and a half. Um, what we are here for today is to uh, celebrate and honor another kind of hero. Yes, those that fought on the battlefields are the people that helped make America today possible. But our hero of today is a hero whose battleground was quite different. It was the courtroom of justice, and also behind bars and behind barbed wire fences, imprisonment during wartime, uh, during the Second World War. It's a uh, film about Min Yasui. He will go down in history as an eloquent and powerful advocate for justice and equality for Japanese Americans, and particularly uh, those uh, that uh, were in incarcerated during the Second World War. But when I first met him, I met a different kind of man. I was a student, a, a summer school student at, in Japan at uh, George Daigaku, or Sophia University, in the uh, international department. My parents thought I was studying in Japanese, but actually it was in English. <laughs> but uh, it was the international de department, and so there were people from uh, throughout the United States, from Latin America, from Europe, as well as other parts of Asia. But there's something, uh, I guess, magnetic about Japanese Americans. We're attracted to each other. and. Uh, although Min is many decades older than me, or was many decades older than me, uh, we connected and we became good friends. He's a warm, friendly guy, not the uh, courtroom orator or the lecture hall uh, uh, professor that uh, most people know, but I knew him as a friend. We, had, we explored many of the restaurants of uh, Tokyo, Roppongi and Yotsuya, that area. And, uh, we went to Ofuro together, Japanese Ofuro, the whole Japanese experience. 
and we became very good friends. But it's after that experience that I came to discover the uh, men that you will see in this film. He was a young attorney who had just opened up his uh, law of practice in Portland, Oregon. And, you know, the, the belief is that the Japanese Americans had that uh, philosophy of shikataganai, nothing can be done, it cannot be helped. But they were, there were people who challenged that injustice. Early on, Min was a young attorney who immediately took a stand. First, there was the curfew. He didn't think that was constitutional. And he tested that before the internment came down. He dressed up in his best suit and tie, and after the curfew hour of 7 p.m., he went out and roamed all around downtown Portland. He window shopped. He went into drugstores and bought chewing gum. He made himself very visible. Nothing happened. He even chatted with policemen. Nothing happened. <laughs> We're quite visible, but nothing happened. By about 10.30, 11 o'clock, he got tired of walking around downtown. <laughs> so he walked into the police station and announced himself with, I'm a Japanese American. What are you going to do about it? And they accommodated him by throwing him in jail. And that was the beginning of uh, min, uh, uh, um, min, uh, <coughs> Min's uh, challenge. And that challenge continued throughout the uh, post-initial uh, 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 curfew period. He challenged that in injustice all the way to the Supreme Court, and the, uh, the Supreme Court ruled against him. But he still didn't give, uh, uh, give up on that. And that's where, where the title comes from, Never Surrender. And you will see his determination, his drive, and his eloquence in this film. And that is making a comment about the eloquence of the film itself. It was made by his daughter, who shares a lot of the same qualities. She is a fighter and a challenger who loves challenges and faces them straight on. And she uh, is carrying that internationally. She lives in Mexico and is active in community activities there in Mexico. I had the privilege of uh, narrating this film uh, by invitation from Holly. and. Uh, I've come to love her just as much as I loved her father. So, ladies and gentlemen, the filmmaker and the daughter of the subject of this film, Holly Yasui. Thank you so much, George. It's a great honor for me to welcome you to the Los Angeles premiere of Never Give Up, not Never Surrender, Minori Yasui and the Fight for Justice. Thank you so much for all of, to all of you for coming. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank some very special people who are here today. My co-director, Will Doolittle from, from Eugene, Oregon, without whom this film would not exist, since he's the real filmmaker on our team, a professional with the knowledge and experience to get the job done. He was also director of photography and editor. I've relied so much on Will's amazing attention to detail, his historical, political, and aesthetic savvy, and most of all, his commitment to the subject matter, justice, and his great patience working for, with a first-time filmmaker like myself. Michelle Connor, our associate producer, born and raised in Japan, now lives in Mexico and has come here from San Miguel de Allende. Bob Bresky and Karen Kai, attorneys who were involved in the reopening of Min Yasui's legal case in the 1980s, are here from San Francisco. June Aoji Burke, whose very first job was as Min Yasui's secretary. 
and she's been a true and steady supporter for all the Minyasui leg legacy projects since its, since its inception. And, of course, George, who is taking off an hour from his very intense shooting schedule today in order to be here. I appreciate that so much. And for making the time from his busy schedule to loan his beautiful, melodious voice to the film as narrator and his, and his stature as a social activist in honor of his friend, Minyasui. And last but not least, many, many thanks to all the folks at the Japanese American National Museum, which is instrumental in the gestation of this film and has supported our project every step along the way. As George mentioned, I've lived in Mexico for over 20 years, but in 2013, upon the invitation of Janum, I came back to the U.S. to participate in their national conference celebrating the 25th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, the Redress Bill. At that conference, I joined Jay Hirabayashi and Karen Korematsu on a panel to talk about our fathers. Minyasui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Fred Korematsu, three men who during World War II were arrested and tried in federal courts for resisting the military orders that resulted in the forced removal of Japanese Americans from the West Coast, and who reopened their cases in 1983 with a special legal procedure called a writ of air quorum nobis. At that time, I also met with Perry, Peggy Nagai, who was my father's lead attorney in his Coram Nobis case, and we hatched the plan for a Minori Sui tribute project on his 100th birthday in 2016. Peggy took on the responsibility of nominating my father for a posthumous Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the nation, and I took on the job of making a documentary. As you'll see in the film, Peggy did succeed in her task, but I'm still working on mine. So, what you'll see today is part one, covering Minyasui's early life up to the end of World War II. The second part of the film will cover his ongoing social justice work in Denver and nationally, including the redress movement of the 1970s and 80s. I hope to finish and integrate that part into a feature-length film in 2018. But this year, upon George Takei's strong urging, we decided to release part one in order to contribute to the discussion regarding the legacy of the World War II Japanese American experience, which has been invoked, <clears throat> which has been invoked by the Trump administration and supporters as a so-called precedent for anti-Muslim policies. On the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066 and my father's challenge of the governmental actions that emanated from that order, we couldn't keep Minyasui in the box, so to speak. My father, forever a champion of civil rights of all people, would never remain silent in the face of such twisted, fact-defying logic or illogic used by the administration to justify anti-democratic, intolerant policies that fly in the face of our most basic constitutional principle of equal justice under the law. Minyasui would stand up and speak out with all the passion and oratorical brilliance that was uniquely his to denounce the injustices we, we see proposed and perpetrated today, not only against Muslims, but also against Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, refugees from all over the world, LGBTQ people, and others singled out by policies that would turn back the clock to undo decades of hard-won advances in civil rights in the United States. I've just come from a meeting in San Francisco, again with Jay Hirabayashi and Karen Kormatsu, along with Peggy Nagai and the other Quorum Novus attorneys who have come together again in order to file an amicus brief at the U.S. Supreme Court in opposition to the Muslim ban. Working on this brief has made me deeply aware of the critical relevance of the events and issues depicted in the film, including the immigrant experience of my Issei grandparents and the exclusion from the West Coast of all persons of Japanese ancestry and subsequent incarceration in concentration camps. This massive violation of civil rights was supposedly justified by what was then called military necessity. 
That's a justification that was roundly debunked by the Corb Nobis cases. Given that we are today engaged in a seemingly endless so-called war against terrorism, justified by claims of what is now called national security, it is time not only to learn the lessons of history, but to act upon them. To make our country great again, not by closing our doors or building walls or taking away our rights, but on the contrary, by fighting for our most fundamental democratic principles of liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and now I will give you Min Sui, an American hero who fought all his life for the civil rights of all people. Well, this is one of the most extraordinary and powerful films. I would like to see its distribution, I say this seriously, among all these wretched Congress people who have, <laughs> no, I'm serious, to disseminate this as widely as possible, well beyond them. I, it must go national, if not international. I'm sorry you didn't add the 1988, the final, you know, the reparations and all the rest of it that followed. And it's constant struggle. But this is such an addition to that struggle. I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. I'd just like to say that the last 10 minutes, is this on? Yeah. Okay. The last 10 minutes, uh, you asked about the uh, 1988 Civil Liberties Act. Um, that is part of the redress. That is the culmination of the redress movement. Uh, that will be something that we'll cover in much more detail in the second part of the film. What we did is we just kind of did a, a summary uh, of hitting on highlights from uh, the end of World War II to, to the present. Um, so that will, there will be definitely in the uh, complete feature-length film, there'll be a lot more treatment on the redress movement and the Quorum Nobis cases, um, as well as his work in Denver. And Holly, um, when do you expect to have the second portion completed? I hope to have it finished uh, next year, in 2018. So my question is, uh, how is your film project getting funded, and do you need donations to complete the funding? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So glad you asked. <laughs> yes, glad you asked. Um, <clears throat> The seed money was uh, um, given for a short tribute film, which we thought would be about three minutes long, by the Denver JACL. But of course, the story really cried out for more than just a three-minute tribute film. Um, so uh, when Will came on, uh, we had a, uh, another associate director, and I uh, embarked on a crowdfunding campaign, um, basically over the internet. When did we start that? 2015, a couple years ago, and money's still dribbling in. Um, and then recently, we've received a grant from the Spirit Mountain Community Foundation. That is the um, Grand Ronde. The yeah, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde in uh, Oregon. That basically is the western part of Oregon. Uh, they also have given us a, a generous grant which you're using for educational outreach and also to finish the film. Um, this is my first film. I didn't realize how long it would take or how much it would take in terms of both effort and, and funding. So the answer to your question about are we still uh, raising funds, yes. Um, please come and take one of these. Um, it was supposed to be a postcard, but it got printed on real flimsy paper, so it's a flyer. It has our... <laughs> it has our um, uh, website address on it where you can make a tax deductible uh, donation. We do have a 501c3 nonprofit fiscal sponsor and also email that we can answer you on. So um, definitely yes. And I'd like to leave this, I don't know, Elizabeth can probably tell me where would be a good place for me to leave these postcards. We can put them on uh, the front desk out in the lobby. Okay. Is it possible to also send in a check by mail? Some people yes. still use posts. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, um, on the web page it will give instructions that we have a street address. It's actually here in California. 
um, as well as an online um, donation. So yes, you can write a check and send it into our fiscal sponsor, uh, which is called From the Heart Productions. If you're not connected, we can give you an address to today. I appreciate that. I am not connected. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, uh, hi, Holly. This is Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Hi. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm so overwhelmed by your film. Thank you so much. Um, if I average both sides of my family, I'm third and a half generation, so I'm so say and a half. Um, and it's so incredible to see our history uh, depicted in your documentary, partly because. In seeing, um, I, of course, as a Japanese American, I see as much as I can about our experience the, of our ancestors, our parents, grandparents, and, and in my case, my great grandparents. And I hear individual stories from my family and my community, uh, mostly Seattle, and then I base here, so some in Los Angeles. But this is a film that ha get, offers, I'm even trying to put this into words that offers the most comprehensive look that I've experienced in watching all the various um, you know, uh, uh, projects that have come out of our communities. Wonderfully so, some are really specific to a particular person's story, but yours offers a, a, the, the bigger picture of how your dad went and traveled to different camps, the different movements going on, uh, whether it was Nono Boys, the, the various, you know, um, uh, ways that we were working to fight injustice or prove loyalty. So can you, uh, this is so big for me to digest right now, I don't know what I'm really asking, except can you speak to something about your vision around that, yours and the, your director's vision around that, and or your father's vision for bringing and fighting, bringing about and fighting justice? Again, this is the most comprehensive look I've ever experienced, you know? Thank you I so thank much, you for Leslie. That. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that because there have been a lot of films uh, made about the uh, forced removal and the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And, um, you know, that was a real challenge, I think, for, mm -hmm. for Will and me. And I do want to give a lot of credit to Will, who brought in a perspective to this film. Um, you know, this is my family story on the one hand, but it is important that it has a larger historical context and that it has relevance to issues that go beyond, that definitely apply to our community, but also go beyond our community. And as I say, I really feel that it was in large part working with Will. I was the scriptwriter, but we did a lot of conferences on every step of the way. Um, for example, I did not know that the Ku Klux Klan was so strong in the state of Oregon. Um, Will is the one who brought that up. He did the research, found the uh, newspaper articles. Um, so again, that gives the larger context, which I, I think is very important. And that my father, Min Yasui, was always emphasizing. He says in one piece there, this is not just for Japanese Americans, for all Americans. Uh, it is a story and it is part of our history as a nation. Um, that needs to be understood in that context. Um, you know, not, as I say, not just a family, it is a family story, but it is also a story about, about America, of what, about what happened in this country, and, um, and, and what are we going to do about situations that have any kind of similarity to, to that. Well, I, I appreciate the complexity because each, uh, our, our, our community, the internalized oppression has showed up in a way that would pit us against each other, whereas we were, we may never have had quite that kind of conflict within each other if we had never been interned in the first place, or incarcerated in the first place. So for some to be certainly siding with Nono Boys where others were fighting in the military, to, to bring that about the complexity of how we were each trying to just cope with what it meant to be American how to survive that that whole incarceration experience. Uh, th it's tremendous and important, and I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, well, I, I felt it was really important to um, bring all those things out. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a white American male. Uh, and uh, But I've been really fortunate to have learned from so many people 
Um, and and for me, Min's story brings all these threads together. Uh, and it's uh, the fact that he his family was well off enough that they had cameras and they took thousands of pictures. And then um, just these things that kept coming out, like the, the footage from Hood River and being able to get those stories from the participants uh, who, you know, uh, Holly's uh, uncle and aunt, uh, all those things being able to come together to, for me was just uh, a beautiful thing to be able to help work on and, and I'm honored to be able to do that. Can I say one more thing? I want to say something about this museum. It is one of the most spectacular and extraordinary institutions in this city. I have learned everything I know as a result of the public programs that have been extraordinary. The only other one I can think of is the California African American Museum to really delve into the complex conflicts that took take place within the community and expose them for, for analysis. And I, I bless this place. Thank you so much. Should I go ahead? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, as the founder of Women's Studies Program, I'm wondering if you couldn't somehow or another work in. Can you hear? Okay. If you can't work in more detail about the extraordinary women in your family, it seems to me that that these women are mentioned in passing, but there's very little detail that would further humanize the story. The the anecdote that you that you gave and that I've read about, about his mother, Min's mother, encouraging him when he was in jail, even though she didn't know where her husband was and, and he was in prison. Also, the daughter who stood at the train station and who founded this, this residence in, what was it, in Colorado, so that her family could, could be ferreted out of these, of these camps. I think if you could somehow or another enlarge that picture, that it would, it would add uh, it would add detail to, to the story that I think is, is lacking because a lot of it is very male oriented especially in terms of draft dodging or, or serving your country etc and I think that you need um, you could use a little bit more detail about the women in the family who seem to me to have been every bit as extraordinary as the men I sort of felt that Yuka is the, you know, vice for stardom with Min Yasui in the film. I wish my Aunt Michi were still alive. Um, she's the one who went to, uh, to Denver. Uh, um, there is a problem, of course, we can't interview my grandmother or my Aunt Michi because they're, they're gone. Um, I'm hoping that in the second half, uh, your, your comment about the, um, the, the draft resistor, the, um, the, what is it called, the loyalty questionnaire and the draft resistance, that's difficult. But that's a good comment because I think women were put in a really difficult position also uh, with that, um, with that uh, questionnaire. We pro might be able to find some people who could comment on that. Um, I'm hoping in the second half of the film, um, I'll be able to, one of the wonderful stories uh, follow-up stories is that at the University of Oregon when they discovered that Michi and seven other uh, Nisei Japanese Americans uh, did not get their degrees because they had to um, either be forcibly removed or in the case of Michi, my aunt, she left. And so in 19... I don't remember the exact year, I'll know as soon as I finish that part of the film. But she went back to the University of Oregon and got her degree. Uh, they made a special ceremony for, uh, for my aunt and for the other seven or eight uh, Japanese Americans who were unable to go to their actual graduation ceremony. And that was a really important um, thing for our family, so that will be featured uh, in the second, second part of the film. And um, you know, I hope to keep Yuka's voice very alive in the film because she is a really great storyteller and has a wonderful presence. Um, but it is, a thank you for the comment, we'll try to 
we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss it. <laughs> um, but it is, it, it is a little difficult at the end. Uh, I hadn't realized, but you're right, that last part of his experience in, uh, in, in the camps is very male-oriented because it has to do with military stuff, which at that time was basically male. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't find a way of bringing back in the, the, um, the woman's role because it was, it was important. It is important. <laughs> do, you have any, do you have any ideas? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh, Lisa. Um, I, I wanted to echo my uh, congratulations that you made a film that mm -hmm. is bigger than one story. Because I think your father is that kind of man, and I think he'd be uh, very proud of two things. One, in this film, I, I think the images of today, the images of Standing Rock, of Black Lives Matter, of, of the uh, uh, massive movements uh, to, uh, uh, for immigra immigration justice, uh, for um, women and uh, uh, LGBTQ, uh, in the context of what's happening now is very moving. And, uh, and, and with your father's voice behind it, it really brings to fore what he meant, even, even to, for today, especially for today. So I appreciate that. And I want to say, Holly, that I'm so proud of you and Peggy and um, the others for what I think you said. You're bringing a lawsuit or you're bringing something together. And I'm so proud of you and, uh, and I hope that uh, Nikkei here, all of us, understand that our role is so much bigger in the history that we come out and we put our voices and our bodies right there with these justice movements that are happening in our country necessarily and, and, and also to support. And could you talk more about it and what can we do? I'd like to, we have two attorneys uh, here who <coughs> worked on the Coram Novus cases uh, back in the 80s and who are, in fact, involved in the drafting. Um, we're not bringing a lawsuit. We are uh, submitting a amicus brief. That is, we are not the litigants. We are not directly involved in the Muslim ban case. But we are going to be submitting what's called a friend of the court brief in which we have information and perspectives that we want the U.S. Supreme Court to take into consideration because these cases never, have never been uh, repudiated in the, at, at that level. So is Bob and, are Bob and Karen here somewhere? Can, let's get a little interaction here. <laughs> if you could, um, the, our attorneys, uh, if they could explain a little bit more um, about the amicus brief that, um, that, that we are planning to submit to the U.S. Supreme Court this fall. Um, well, I think you covered it, Holly. This is exactly <laughs> what we're trying to do. Um, the only thing I would add is that, um, as we've done um, a number of times in the past, especially over the last 10, 15 years, is that the brief would be submitted on behalf of the children of all three men um, who had uh, challenged the uh, internment orders uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, Fred Minya Sui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Fred Koromatsu, their children, Hale Yasui, um, Jay Hirabayashi, and Karen Koromatsu, along with a number of other organizations, will be submitting in a, what Hale said was an amicus brief, friend of the court brief, uh, in the context of the Supreme Court's review of the uh, Muslim travel ban executive orders. Um, the the, the term and experience, both in its human terms and its legal terms, in its legal history, I think is, we believe is incredibly relevant to the task before the Supreme Court today. Uh, in the 40s, the Supreme Court failed, refused to exercise its power as a third branch of government to critically review um, orders that impinged on the uh, fundamental rights of 120,000 people, and by directly, and extension by extension, the rest of uh, America. 
And today, uh, the government is asking the Supreme Court to keep its hands off of any critical review of the executive orders uh, banning uh, travel from the six Muslim countries and all of the other aspects of the executive order. And our message to, to the court will be is that as a third branch of government, you cannot accept that, that hands-off position when you have sweeping bans on or sweeping violations of our fundamental values, our fundamental rights and values. Um, the court, as a third branch of government, has to be able to review the justification for those sorts of actions um, as a co-equal branch of government. And that function as a, of the courts is critically relevant precisely in times of crisis, wartime, because it's in those times when the political branches, under political pressure, under wartime hysteria as a commission, and Congress found a commission with redress, will most trample on um, our, our values and our rights. Um, so the, the court's role in, at those times is critical to the maintenance of a democracy, a constitutional democracy, and that will be our message to the court. Would it include the deportation, uh, and I'm thinking especially of those south of this border at all? Because is that is did that you, did you hear? Of deportations also? <coughs> the brief isn't written yet, so exactly how what it's going to address. But the, the real focus is the executive order is dealing with the the immigration from those countries, people seeking entry into the U.S., which is what it addresses. All right, we have time for three more questions. We're going to do one and then two on that side. Good afternoon. Uh, I have the, my name is Ron Ikajir. I have the grace um, uh, uh, privilege to have a chance to work with Min Yusui from 1978 to 1984 in Washington, D.C. And what I would comment about what you have put together, it really shows we could not have had a more eloquent speaker on redress. Some that has lived it, went through it, and the benefit that I would like to have is try to get in and out on whatever you're going to do on part one and two, whatever changes, because um, the longer you push it, it becomes another story. What came across to me today is that, uh, one, I did not know, and I work with both of them, that Mike Masaoka and Min Yasui were really at odds at one point in time. Uh, unbelievable. And the second part is at the end, they work together Absolutely. to try to go forward with redress. And um, I just wish that uh, men would have told me in the early 80s that he felt that his health was not as good as it was. Because he was a fighter. You would never know that he was not feeling well. And uh, I know that's why he wanted to redress the past quickly. And so I think we're all honored by what you've done. And let's just kind of keep it going. I'm surprised, Ron, that you didn't know that um, about Masaoka and Yasui. And that is an important part of the second um, part of the film, that they did work together um, very closely uh, on the redress movement. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about the early part. Mm -hmm. Is this Masayoka a relative to Kathy Masayoka? I don't know. I, I don't know who Kathy Masayoka is. Um, I don't know if anybody She's else. She's very, very active. And, uh, I don't know if this is her It's mom. not an uncommon name. It's not very common, but it, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I don't know the answer to that. So, um... <coughs> Um, hi, Holly, it's Barbara. Um, Barbara, I... <laughs> hi. Um, I was very moved by the film, and uh, the editing was great, and um, 
having the footage of your father actually speaking was so powerful and to put it, you know, have it come in and out, his voice, um, I thought was really powerful. And a um, uh, couple things I just want to say that, uh, you know, I met you about 25 years ago and your commitment to social justice and being so active, not just talking, but actually walking that talk. Um, it really moved me to see this film and to see, you know, your legacy. Um, and I also know that there's other activities besides the film that you've been working on. And, and in the film, we saw that one march, but I thought there were like two marches, two different years in Oregon. Um, so I don't know, I thought maybe you could talk more about the broader movement besides the film and give people some more information. So, thanks. Thanks. Barbara and I met in Mexico, I guess about 25 years ago. Barbara's also an activist uh, with her It Goes Away activity and your uh, permaculture work. Um, as regards, the, there was the first march happened on the first Minori Yasui Day, which was 2015. Right? Yeah, two years ago. Um, last year we premiered this film. Um, the day has been declared by the Oregon State Legislature as an in perpetuity uh, day for uh, honoring Minori Yasui, so there will be other activities uh, every year. Um, the organization in uh, Oregon that we've been working with is called the Oregon Nikkei Endowment. Um, we're hoping to have uh, essay contests, uh, things that will involve young people, students, um, and have that on a yearly basis um, so that uh, this is a area of history and uh, an area of current events that we hope uh, young people um, will be drawn into and um, informed about and also inform others. Um, we also uh, are in the process of bringing the film to libraries, the Oregon library system, which is uh, in some ways, it's, it's hard to get into the schools teacher by teacher, um, maybe to some of the school districts, but uh, that is another thing that we're trying to do in the state of Oregon. I'd love to do it in California as well. Um, do you have any other uh, comments? The curriculum? Uh, oh, yes, we have. Um, well, you might know more than I, but uh, uh, an exciting uh, teacher, Sarah Siegel in uh, Hood River, Min's hometown, um, has been really working hard to develop a curriculum and work with uh, middle school, well, she's working with middle school students, but I believe it's uh, growing beyond that level. And uh, so uh, they're really working hard to put a curriculum together that would uh, help um, incorporate this film and, and activities and, and ways to teach about these issues. And, and because clearly that's one major uh, thing that we need to be doing is bringing our young people up uh, to understand uh, not only their rights but their responsibilities and um, how, how these things, uh, how we can make a difference by uh, taking action in different ways. And we have our last question here. First I'll say this is not a complaint <laughs> and I smile when I say this because, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I just Notice your map and how you had identified the location of different camps, uh, detention camps, and you left out the great state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the largest ones that I understand that exists and that it has been reopened and they were putting the Hispanics who there now. And that's how I happened to hear about it and learn about it. And if you know, I can understand why too you were on the West Coast and you were covering that and the subject matter, but not to imply that there were other states and there are still, those camps are some of them are still being used for Hispanics now. And I just happen to see it as a documentary on the Education Channel. 
I just like to mention there are two types, well, not, no, not only two, but there were different types of camps. Um, the WRA, War Relocation Authority camps, there were the 10 that we showed. There were a number of others, for example, I mentioned Santa Fe, which was where my grandfather was, was interned. I know that uh, Janum and June is working on Tuna Canyon. So there were other uh, detention centers, camps, a number of them, as you say, in Texas. Crystal City was a camp for... Um, and that was for that American Japanese. Mm -hmm. it was, it, as I understand it, there were also German and, and uh, Italian aliens and their families who were, of course, American citizens. So we had to kind of limit it. Um, I have a map that shows all of the 10 WRA camps and then a number of other camps which were under the auspices of the uh, US Department of Justice, um, which were not included. Um, the map gets very, <laughs> it's very uh, complicated, but that's what I think you're referring to in terms of um, Texas. Um, the reason why I focus on the West Coast is because of those uh, exclusion zones that were created uh, by General John DeWitt. It was in fact the western part of the United States where people were uh, excluded, were forced to leave. Um, and in the other states, more inland, uh, people were allowed to stay there. For example, I think Lisa grew up in Idaho and her family did not have to move because they were outside of the West Coast zones. So that's the reasoning behind uh, focusing on the on the West Coast. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually out of time now, but um, both Holly and Will will be um, staying around here and outside in the lobby to ask any more questions if anybody has them. So please hold on to your questions until then. But um, could you please tell us, Will, um, is this film going to be available for distribution, or how can other people who aren't here today be able to see it later in the future? Yeah, I think we're still kind of working on uh, the best way to do that. We've talked about producing some DVDs for people who still use DVDs, uh, which is becoming you know, another uh, old technology, but uh, also we are talking about streaming and having available online for streaming uh, and uh, access that way. And um, if you sign up um, through the website or through Facebook, there's a Facebook uh, page, um, Minori Yasui Film. Uh, you know, that's a way that uh, we would get the word out to let people know how to access that in the future. And could you um, tell the audience what the website um, address is, as well as the Facebook uh, name again? Uh, the website is Ms. Minoru Yasui film.com, uh, .org, .org, and on Facebook, it's, uh, you can search Minoru Yasui Film. And, and, and are both of those on that flyer right over there? I don't have the Facebook name on it because I didn't know what it was, but please take a flyer because it does have our website, and then there's an email associated with, um, with that website, and we can keep you apprised of um, of the distribution progress. We hope to have this film distributed by the Center for Asian American Media, CAM, out of um, San Francisco, uh, and they are an educational and community um, distributor. Uh, it's really a lot of work, so I'm hoping they'll take it on. It's a good organization. Um, but in the meantime, um, we're trying to accommodate um, as many uh, organizations and individuals as we can through our website uh, and we do have a mailing list which will keep you um, which will keep you updated on you know what's happening with the film where there's screenings and and it, how you can get um, copies of the film is sundance appropriate uh, it's too late for sundance they have real strict rules about how you can enter and, and yeah so but it, it's it showed that uh, it was screened at the uh, Disorient Asian American Film Festival in uh, Eugene, Oregon, and uh, uh, being submitted to others as okay. well. How about Amnesty International? We're looking into any possibility we can come and we can get involved with. Anybody who has contact with organizations like Amnesty, or if you're a librarian or a teacher, 
and have contact with schools. We want to hear from you because my top priority, and I think Will is probably the same, is education and community groups. This is where I'm not interested in commercially uh, distributing the film. I want this film to get to the students and to community groups. Uh, so anybody who has contacts, uh, we'd greatly appreciate your letting us know uh, through our website. Uh, we have an email that you can reach us through our, our website. So we'll leave some of those flyers on the podium and we'll also have some out on um, the lobby as well. Uh, please join me in to thank, thank you very much. Holly and Will for sharing this.